Welcome to Brookings. I'm Ted Pacone. I'm a senior fellow with the Project on International Order and Strategy here at the Foreign Policy Program. And we're here today to talk about the very complex issue of U.S. security assistance and human rights and how the U.S. government tries to reconcile these uh, two important parts of the U.S. national security strategy, um, both conceptually but also operationally. And as many of you know, uh, the U.S. spends over $25 billion a year both training and equipping foreign military forces and law enforcement forces uh, of more than 100 countries. So it's a large enterprise and inevitably raises a number of very uh, complicated issues when it comes to our, foreign, our, our human rights concerns in a number of countries. Um, today you'll hear a bit about the, the Leahy Law, which is now applies to both state and the Defense Department, and is a way in which the U.S. tries to vet units that it trains to make sure that we are not associated with uh, human rights violations, but also as a way to leverage some kind of corrective behavior on the part of the host government. So we'll hear about that. But we'll also hear more broadly about how our security assistance operations are working around the world, including in the Middle East, uh, where the counterterrorism, of course, is the focus. And we're working not just with uh, military forces from host nations, but with militias and rebel groups and local groups, which raises our, uh, another set of, of very complex problems. So to address uh, these issues today, we're going to hear featured remarks from Tom Malinowski, who is the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. He's been in that position for over two and a half years. And pr prior to that, he was the Washington Director for Human Rights Watch. Um, you have uh, their bio, so I'm not going to review the whole uh, list, but a very impressive uh, record of public service, both at the National Security Council and the State Department, in the Clinton administration, on the Hill for Senator Moynihan, um, and in the nonprofit sector. We will then uh, engage uh, Daniel Byman, who is a senior fellow here in the Center for Middle East Policy and also a professor uh, at the Georgetown University Walsh School of Foreign Service in Security Studies. Um, Dan has uh, also a remarkable record of service, in particular uh, on the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks in the United States, the 9-11 Commission, um, and subsequent efforts uh, to understand and improve the way the United States handles intelligence and security policy. We'll engage in a panel discussion up here, and then we'll engage you all in a Q&A. In &A. Um, we look forward to the discussion, and I will turn the microphone over to Tom for some opening remarks. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you uh, so much, Ted, for um, asking me to come and talk to you guys today and for the introduction. Um, I'm very glad that somebody's taking care of international order and strategy. Uh, how's that going? Yeah. Um, and, and I also want to thank you for, um, for your help with uh, another uh, project that we have been uh, engaged in, which is really very relevant to the, the subject of today's discussions. As um, some of you may know, the United States is currently the president of an organization called the Community of Democracies, yay. Um, I like to think I'm the president of the Community of Democracies uh, in my capacity as Assistant Secretary of DRL. And we have a, a project uh, in the CD that, um, that Ted is actually spearheading with uh, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright that, uh, that aims to look at how best to address security challenges uh, in a democratic way. So. Uh, looking at countries like Tunisia and others that, that are struggling to get this, this balance um, right. Um, this is a really big topic, and um, usually uh, when it's written about, when it's spoken about, particularly in the large bureaucracy that I work in, it's addressed in somewhat abstract ways. And um, I, I like to start with um, real-world examples. Um, the, the examples from which we actually derive 
those larger principles. Um, and I will, I'll start with um, uh, a place that I recently visited, actually one of the most interesting trips that I have taken uh, in this job, and it was to the east coast of Kenya, to the city of Mombasa. Um, this is, as I'm sure you guys know, uh, a part of East Africa where the Al-Shabaab uh, terrorist group is active in recruiting young people to join its ranks and where it has carried out a number of terrible attacks. Now in Somalia, where Al-Shabaab is based, we, the United States, have supported um, African Union forces to protect civilians and to go after this group. Uh, and where necessary to protect ourselves, we have taken direct action against it ourselves. We provide support to Kenyan security forces um, operating in Somalia for this purpose, and we help them to uh, try to protect their own people at home. I want to start with that because I, I don't want anything I say today to be construed as an argument that war is exclusively an exercise in winning over hearts and minds. We train and equip security forces, our own first and foremost, and those of our partners, to engage in their primary mission, which is the use of force. Sometimes we talk about this in euphemistic terms. We talk about kinetic operations and so forth. What we're talking about is killing people. And that is, sadly, in this world, sometimes necessary. Some people who want to kill us are not going to be stopped unless we stop them. The reason that we talk about the other side of the coin, not just those of us who work at the Human Rights Bureau at the State Department, but my colleagues who work um, at DOD um, and uh, in our military commands around the world, is that we recognize, we have learned the hard way, that very few of the threats that we have to use force against can be eliminated by force alone. Um, nor do we want our armed forces or those of our partner nations around the world to have to fight the same battles again and again against enemies whose strategy is not to beat us on the battlefield because they know that they can't do that, it's to induce us to respond to their attacks in ways that reinforce their narrative and feed their recruitment. So that's what we were looking at um, in Mombasa and in many other trips that I've taken to similar places around the world. How are young Muslim men in a place like this recruited? Why do they join? How can they be discouraged from doing so? And if they do, how can they be induced to change their minds and to come home. Um, and one of the really interesting things um, that I found uh, in that visit is that m much of the really good and effective work on answering those questions and in actually doing something to uh, advance our goals was being done by civil society groups and religious groups uh, on, uh, on the ground. That's who we are learning the most from. And by we, again, I don't just mean the Human Rights Bureau at the State Department, but um, our military and the folks who are directly involved in our security assistance efforts. Now, what we found in Mombasa, and again, I'm just using this as a stand-in for many other similar places, um, is that there are a lot of factors that lead to, uh, to this problem. Some of them are economic. Um, young men feel that there's just no hope for them. They, they come of age, there's no job, there's no way to provide for a family, no way to get um, dignity. And then this organization shows up at their doorstep and offers them structure, offers them a sense of purpose. But the motivation also is fueled by a sense that in the past their community, the Muslim community, in eastern Kenya has been collectively punished um, when a terrorist attack happens, that the police in their neighborhoods is sometimes abusive and corrupt and not worthy of respect. And then these Al-Shabaab guys come 
to their doorstep and they say, we can help you fight back. We can help you gain pride in that fight. We can help you gain dignity in that fight. And then when they go off and join, and some of them realize what a mistake they have made, in some cases they're afraid to come home and to turn themselves in, even though this is something the Kenyan government has offered them through various amnesty uh, programs, because they're afraid of what those security forces might do to them uh, if they give up. So it, this leads to an obvious conclusion. Yes, we do have to fight where necessary, but just as important to be effective in that fight, we have to build trust between security institutions and the communities that they protect. We have to avoid and we have to help our partners avoid the human rights abuses that undermine that trust and we have to encourage them to work with rather than try to suppress the civil society groups that give people in these communities nonviolent means of getting redress for their grievances and that can serve as a bridge between the authorities and um, these people. Um, to go back to the Mombasa uh, example, when we talked to um, organizations and people in the community who were working to try to bring young men home from al-Shabaab, um, it was absolutely clear that, that these young men are much, much more likely to turn themselves in to, say, a, a, a council of religious elders in their community or even a human rights organization rooted in that community um, to a group that can actually give them some assurance of protection and fair treatment than they are to walk into a police station or to an army post and to say, I want to um, come home. And you know what? That should be fine. And from our point of view, that is fine because the goal is to get them to come home off the battlefield so we don't have to keep killing them there. So the key principle in any effective strategy has got to be that, building trust. We apply that principle, we try to apply it in the way that we conduct our own military operations. Many of you know that uh, President Obama recently issued an executive order that tries to memorialize and build upon uh, all of the steps we have taken in this administration and the last one uh, in the wars in Afghanistan and, and Iraq um, to try to make sure that we are doing everything possible to avoid causing civilian casualties in our own operations and that when we do cause them, we take responsibility. And it's a principle that we apply in our security assistance efforts. And of course, there are a lot of other examples around the world that show why this is necessary. If you look at the, the biggest um, security challenge we face right now in, in Iraq um, and Syria with ISIL, it's absolutely clear where, where that comes from. It, it, it came from um, a situation in which the governments and security forces of these two countries lost the trust of their people to the point where in many uh, Sunni communities in both countries, people started fearing their security forces at a certain point more than they feared these uh, strange foreign men uh, wearing, waving their black flags coming in uh, under the pretense of liberating them from uh, their oppression. Um, this is clearly a central problem that remains uh, in Syria today. You all may have heard the news um, that the city of Palmyra, which uh, Assad's forces with a lot of Russian help took from ISIS uh, a while back, apparently today fell uh, again uh, to ISIS. Why is that? Because Assad cares a hell of a lot more about fighting his own people in Aleppo and has diverted his forces there, leaving himself wide open to an enemy that he has cared a lot less uh, about uh, fighting. Um, it's true in countries where we are closely partnering uh, with, with allies to meet these threats. In Nigeria, uh, for example, in the fight against Boko Haram there, the vast majority of the people of Nigeria want Boko Haram uh, defeated. They want and need uh, their government to protect them. And so the potential there for an effective counterinsurgency that unites the people and, and the government against this common threat is absolutely there, but only if the military avoids human rights abuses and holds itself accountable 
when they happen, and that's what we're trying to promote through our assistance to Nigeria. Another great model, um, I think, historically has been Colombia. It's not a perfect model because we all know that when, fin when fighting the FARC, uh, the, the, the left-wing rebels uh, in, in Colombia with which the government just entered into a peace agreement, uh, the Colombian armed forces did commit a number of very serious uh, human rights abuses. But in the midst of that war, the government did begin to take s steps to hold those security forces accountable. Hundreds of them were dismissed uh, or prosecuted. Um, and I think it's no accident that the government's increasing success in the fight against the FARC coincided with greater attention to accountability and human rights. Many factors contributed uh, to that improvement, but one of those factors was that the United States, um, over the years, conditioned an, a lot of our assistance uh, to the Cambodian, uh, uh, to the Colombian, a um, lot of sea countries entering my mind these days, uh, Colombian military on their human rights performance. And one way in which we did it, and this gets back to where you started, is the Leahy Law. The great thing about the Leahy Law is that unlike past exercises in legislative, uh, legislated conditionality on U.S. assistance, it does not say if country X commits human rights abuses, we cannot provide support to country X. It says if a unit of a foreign security force has committed serious human rights abuses and not held the perpetrators accountable, then we cannot provide assistance to that unit. It is a scalpel. It enables us, as we did in Colombia, to continue helping a country deal with a very serious security threat while at the same time allowing us to withhold assistance in a targeted way from those elements of that country's security forces where the problem um, has been um, concentrated. Now, um, and actually Colombia is one of the first places where the U.S. government really took the Leahy Law seriously back in a day when Yes, the law was on the books, but we had not yet developed both the systems and the tradition of consistently applying it across the world as we do today. Now, over the last decade, we have professionalized our Leahy vetting process. We've created a system where every day around uh, the world, uh, our embassies um, are uh, vetting units, vetting individual participants in uh, our military training programs. Um, in fact, we have vetted, we are now vetting 180,000 units and individuals uh, every single year, considering both DOD and State Department uh, assistance. We've doubled down on what we call Leahy outreach, uh, explaining the Leahy law and the vetting process to our partners at DOD and our embassies worldwide. Over the last year, um, our Little Human Rights Bureau's uh, leadership has visited every uh, U.S. military combatant command apart from UCOM, uh, and many of our embassies and consulates overseas to address and resolve Leahy concerns uh, as they uh, come up. We've also focused on teaching and modeling what we call Leahy diplomacy. The whole point of the law is to prompt a discussion with our foreign partners on how we can help them develop institutions of accountability. I've used Leahy diplomacy many times all over the world. Um, a good recent example, I was in Sri Lanka, where um, in 2009, uh, the armed forces of that country under what was then a much more authoritarian government finished off a uh, domestic insurgency, the, the, uh, uh, the Tamil Tigers, um, in um, a, um, a, a terrible uh, kind of final orgy of bloodletting in which thousands and thousands of civilians uh, were killed, many uh, people taken uh, prisoner, executed. Um, our relationship with Sri Lanka was estranged for a number of years uh, as a result of this because we tro joined international calls for accountability. We now have um, a very different government, democratically elected, 
government in Sri Lanka that is committed to democracy and human rights and that has worked with us at the United Nations to make joint commitments to hold perpetrators of human rights abuses on both sides of that conflict accountable. So we want to help Sri Lanka. We want to provide all kinds of assistance. We want to rebuild a full and complete and unfettered relationship between our military and the Sri Lankan military. Um, but at the same time, we have to insist that these past um, cases of human rights abuses are addressed. And the Leahy Law gives us a great way to do that because it does allow us over time to start to restart assistance and cooperation with the military while again focusing on those units and individuals that were most problematic. And the fact that it is a law enables me, as I did a few weeks ago, to sit down with the heads of the Sri Lankan Navy, Air Force, and Army and to say, here's what you've got to do. Um, and if you support your, your civilian government's um, commitments to start a legal process to investigate these allegations and to hold people accountable, here's what we're going to be able to do to help you. And that's not just me speaking um, uh, about our policy preferences. It is the law in the United States. And they understand and respect that um, this is something that we, we have to do. We can't get around it. And that actually helps us a great deal. Um, so we've used that stick. But we've also given our partners an off-ramp. Um, one of the um, uh, objectives of the law is to encourage something that we call remediation. And we now have um, a formal uh, policy for the remediation of units that have previously been denied assistance under the Leahy Law, a policy that we have agreed to after a lot of careful work with uh, the Department of Defense. It's basically a roadmap that will show a foreign military force. If this unit is having trouble receiving US training, here are the specific steps that it can take in order to, in effect, to get off of that black um, list. Um, we launched this policy last year. We now have a number of cases um, where units have gone through uh, the policy and, and been restored into the light, uh, as, as one might say. Um, a good example uh, uh, where we've used this effectively is in Afghanistan. In four cases in the last year, um, because the Afghan government credibly investigated, prosecuted, and punished individual members of its security force units responsible for human rights abuses, we're now able to work again with those remediated units. Um, during his first visit as president to Washington in 2015, uh, the Afghan president, uh, Ashraf Ghani, publicly and privately vowed to combat abuses by his security forces and to hold perpetrators accountable. Last year, the Afghan Ministry of Interior established a special commission to track, evaluate, and finalize uh, action on these kinds of cases. Um, the Afghan MOI and the defense ministry are finalizing plans for a new agency, uh, the Afghan Human Rights uh, Ombudsman, and so on and so on. These are all very concrete results of a partnership between the United States and a foreign security partner um, in which we have used these provisions in US law to try to incentivize um, reforms and steps that are very much in its own uh, interest and the right thing to do. Um, there are other laws that uh, enable us to um, uh, to do this kind of thing. Another one um, uh, is the, the Child Soldiers Protection Act, which, as the name suggests, um, uh, focuses on the very particular scourge of armed forces around the world recruiting uh, children uh, uh, to, uh, to serve in their armed forces. Um, the Child Soldier Prevention Act requires the State Department to identify countries that have governmental armed forces or government-supported armed groups that recruit and use child soldiers. We've used this list to call attention to countries of concern and, in some cases, to sanction them by withholding some or all of our military assistance. A good example here is CHAD. 
a country that has long been of concern for the use of kids uh, in conflict. Um, under the law, we listed Chad as a country of concern in 2010. In 2011, it signed a joint action plan with the UN outlining the steps it needed to take to end uh, this practice. And in 2014, it fulfilled the action plan and we found that children were no longer involved in the Chadian National Army. And we've tried to replicate that progress in a number of other places around the world. So that's some of what we have done. Um, looking forward, and I'm doing a lot of looking backward and forward in my last 40-some days uh, as uh, Assistant Secretary in this job. Um, one, one thought that I have had in looking at these issues is that our security assistance efforts around the world can serve two different, two distinct purposes, uh, which uh, are both legitimate, but sometimes find themselves in conflict. In some cases, we are deliberately aiding a foreign security force to actually do something, to, to achieve a particular security objective, helping to fight an insurgency, for example, helping to protect its border or to defeat a terrorist group. In other cases, security assistance is provided more with the aim of solidifying relationships with a partner government. Now, you might think that we pay less attention to human rights in the first of those two situations where we're helping partner forces that are engaged in conflict. In fact, for all the reasons I mentioned, the opposite is the case. We have an even greater stake in holding foreign security forces accountable and in providing equipment and training that is actually suited for the task when we're working with partner forces that are actually trying to do something because we want them to be operationally effective. And human rights requirements are not just the right thing to do in those situations. They are actually one of our insurance policies to ensure effectiveness. I, I have noticed, and you know, you guys who followed the debates around the Leahy Law know that there has at times been um, uh, friction with some in the Defense Department um, who uh, perhaps understandably see the Leahy Law as an obstacle to doing some of the things that they want to do. What, what really surprised and heartened me when I took this job is that in the places where our military is actually engaged in helping a foreign security partner fight a war, the Leahy Law actually tends to be more popular than in places where the primary orientation of our security assistance missions is building relationships. Because the war fighters know human rights abuses kill the mission. They want the mission to succeed. The Leahy Law gives them a tool, a very, um, a, a very fine tool, to uh, achieve uh, our goals. And in fact, um, I think particularly looking at the Middle East, I think you, you will see that we have been gradually shifting the way that we provide security assistance to a number of partners as the aim of our security relationship with them shifts somewhat from the relationship building mold to the um, achieve a security objective mold. So for example, in Egypt, we have been moving away from um, what is called cash flow financing, a kind of long-term um, guarantee that Egypt um, has, um, has tried to maintain um, of the provision of all kinds of weapons that, that may or may not be relevant to the security challenges that that country faces. Um, shifting from that to a focus on training and equipment that's actually useful to doing the things that Egypt needs to do, border security and fighting terrorism in uh, the Sinai. And on top of that, we have not been able to make the necessary human rights certifications needed to unlock the final 15% of the aid that Congress, the military aid that Congress um, has provided to Egypt. Um, in Yemen, uh, where we have a lot of concern about civilian casualties caused by the Saudi-led coalition. We have uh, been reviewing all of our support uh, to that 
uh, coalition to ensure that we will not be complicit in the kinds of strikes that cause um, civilian casualties. So just a couple of examples. There are, there are many others in that vein. Um, I, I will end um, by um, touching uh, uh, on something that, that you also mentioned um, at the start, and, and that is the, the vastness and complexity of this apparatus that, that has grown and evolved over the years in the U.S. government to provide security assistance to uh, our partners. You mentioned that in the past th few years, uh, security assistance has averaged around 23 or so billion dollars a year. Since 9-11, I think it's, uh, it's over $250 billion that we have provided uh, in one form or another to support foreign security forces. Um, much of this funding was provided through one-year special authorities, um, which has made planning and coordinated approaches very, very difficult. Um, we're up to, um, I'm told, well over 100 distinct congressional authorities uh, through which this work must be done. And quite honestly, um, we don't always have a clear, well-organized picture, even within the U.S. government, of what is being spent where or whether it's effective, because we track these distinct authorities and funds rather than countries and strategies as um, a whole. And if you look at that increasingly complex landscape, what makes it tougher is that the jump in funding has happened primarily um, on the DOD side, with the State Department expected to provide oversight and foreign policy guidance without a lot of additional um, resources uh, or uh, expertise. Um, since 9-11, DOD has seen an increase in funding of 111 percent. That is not the case when it comes to the State Department. Um, the Congress um, has just passed uh, a defense authorization bill, about the only bill that ever consistently passes the Congress <laughs> these days, um, which includes some reforms that potentially address um, some of the DOD-specific um, concerns uh, in, in this area. It combines a number of the DOD authorities into a single streamlined authority, requires a congressional budget justification for uh, the first time ever on DOD security assistance, um, requires DOD to start doing more serious monitoring and evaluation, and of course, as we've mentioned, Leahy law already applies to all of that, and so a more coherent structure for doing it will make it easier um, for uh, for us to ensure that what we all agree must be done in terms of marrying our human rights and security objectives can, in fact, um, be done. So I hope that it will be done. Um, I have no idea what uh, the future is going to bring uh, in all these areas. And uh, if you ask me, um, I'm not going to bring out my crystal ball. Um, but I am very proud of what we have been able to do, as incomplete as I would acknowledge it is uh, in the Obama administration. And I'm particularly proud at, uh, of the work that uh, the, the very small bureau uh, that I lead and, and the really wonderful team that we have built uh, in my bureau focusing on security and human rights has been able to do to move us forward on all these issues. So again, thank you. Uh, and I'm looking forward to all of your questions. Okay. Are you live yet? Okay. All right. Great.
Thank you, Tom. Uh, those are really comprehensive and inspiring remarks. And I think your last comment, uh, taking note of the context in which we're meeting and discussing this is important because we are looking at a transition that raises a number of questions for folks. So I think making it clear where we are, how far we've come in the last several years, and not just under the Obama administration. My first position in, in, in executive government was at the Pentagon at an Office for Democracy and Human Rights, which lasted one year. We haven't seen it since. Um, but there's been this kind of funny evolution of measures and policies and now laws that try to really wrestle with this problem because I think your point about the effectiveness of our assistance is critical and what's driving a lot of the uh, combining coherence, growing convergence of the different issues here. I'm going to ask Dan Byman to reflect a little bit from particular from a security point of view. Dan recently published a paper on the Lawfare blog uh, that's also available on our website on the effectiveness of our, in particular, counterterrorism training in the Middle East. So, Dan, over to you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, and thank you all for coming out this morning. Uh, my remarks, based on my own work, are going to describe some of the problems the United States has had in implementing training programs especially with regard for, to counterterrorism. Uh, the important caveat being that I believe very strongly in these programs, and I also believe very strongly in attempts to integrate human rights into them. Uh, probably half the work I've done at Brookings ends up with a call for more of these programs, expanding funding, uh, more senior effort to them. So my criticism is meant for ways for us to think about them in terms of their limits, but also to recognize that they're vital and so, very briefly, why do I think they're vital? Um, I would say a couple things. Uh, in general, from a counterterrorism point of view, uh, ending or reducing wars is vital. Right? People talk about drivers of terrorism, and one thing they often miss is that wars themselves are drivers of terrorism. That having open spaces where militant groups can arm, train, organize, build many armies is exceptionally dangerous. And the more you can shrink that space or eliminate it altogether is vital. And that that's best done not by American troops usually, but by troops from the country, from the region, from the area. And this is cheaper. But beyond that, it's much more effective. Right? The, we're in the teach a man to fish sort of model, where if the United States come and does it and then leaves, it often doesn't do any good in the long term. Uh, but this is particularly complex from a training point of view, especially as you get into issues that involve non-state actors as well. So let me lay out some of the reasons I feel it's hard. And what I'll stress is that American influence or the influence of outside actors is usually exceptionally limited. So often we'll have programs, we'll have guarantees, we'll have objectives, but we have to recognize that our influence is likely to be limited. And to me, that's not bad, right? If you say that we're going to do a policy that's much cheaper and more effective than putting American boots on the ground directly, but our influence will be limited, I'll say fine. I'll take it. But I often think expectations are a bit too high. So let's begin. Uh, when you're working with security forces, especially when you're working to train internal security forces, uh, you're often working with the least democratic part of an undemocratic country. Right? You're working with the state organs that are in charge of repression. And so in Egypt, you are helping the group that disrupts legitimate democratic dissent, as well as fights an Islamic State affiliate in Sinai. And you can try to maneuver to help one side but not the other, but it is very hard at a local level to be able to differentiate. And this is something that is a constant problem, which is our programs in the end are not controlled by us. The locals involved have huge influence, have huge influence over who gets what. And it is almost... I would say unrealistic of us to expect too much control just because we're not going to be the ones ultimately doing this. Um, also, when you have these powerful civil wars in particular, but in general powerful uh, dynamics in the country, the, whatever is gained in training can easily be overwhelmed. Where you know, anyone who has been to an HR training event and offsite, right, you go, you absorb the material, you nod, you check the boxes, and then you often go back to your job and do what you're doing already, right? That the training is ancillary to your day-to-day. -day. Uh, magnify that by about 1,000. 
when you get to civil wars where that are life and death matters for those involved. And in particular, the training can't replace or really change local politics in a dramatic way. So in Iraq, you had an incredibly expensive uh, security force trained by the United States for many years, very impressive uh, people involved. So it's not a question of competence. It's not a question of resources. We saw that force melt away in Mosul in 2014 when it was faced by a force that was numerically inferior, that was inferior in terms of equipment, inferior in terms of training, but not inferior in terms of its morale and cohesion. So the force melted away, and sectarianism, bad governance, corruption, all these things meant that the military force that had been trained up didn't actually want to fight. Um, often you have intense local rivalries that make it exceptionally difficult to have a coherent force, where factions within the government, and especially when you're dealing with non-state actors, factions within the groups themselves will be fighting each other. Um, in many of these countries, you'll have weak national identities. So being Iraqi, being Syrian, these are things that are not false, right? There certainly is a real identity called being an Iraqi. But there are many other identities that are vying for a political salience that enable divisions within groups. Um, and all this is part of a lack of legitimate government, right? That in many countries in the world, the government is not accepted as legitimate by a significant amount of the people, right? And that could be due to sectarian or ethnic divisions. It could be due to corruption. It could be due to it being a dictatorial government that has no consent of the governed. It's a long reason that governments lack legitimacy. But when you're asking people to fight on behalf of a government they do not see as legitimate, things change dramatically. It's a much more transactional relationship and it's one that's much more vulnerable to short-term disruption. But the thing to remember when we are talking about fighting insurgencies is this is almost likely in every single case. Right? There is a reason a country has an insurgency. There is a reason a country has a civil war. Right? And that is often because the government is bad, either incompetent or it is hostile by much of the people. And these are the things that produce insurgencies and civil wars so not surprisingly, these dynamics are present when the United States comes in and tries to train them. If the United States wants to train up the Canadian military, I think that's going to go very well. If the United States wants to train up a military uh, where an insurgency is raging, it has to recognize there are reasons for the insurgency in the first place. Um, as a result of all these problems, many governments in the world politicize their militaries. So often the officer corps, especially the senior officer corps, is chosen primarily due to political loyalty. In some cases, being competent can be a negative. Right? If you think about your average dictator, the ragtag insurgency on the fringe of the country, that's a problem. Skilled generals in the capital who control armed forces, that's a real problem. Right? That's much more of a threat to their power and their, and their ability to influence and control their own country. So. It is smart for them to put in place uh, senior officials who are exceptionally loyal, and that might be due to family ties. It makes sense to put in place senior officials who are not particularly competent at times. One thing you very much want to do is make sure different parts of the military are not talking to each other. Right? So if we had a military officer up here, what he or she would say would be that one of the keys to effective military oper uh, operations is unity of command, right? that you have a unity of effort. One of the keys to being an effective dictator is disunity, right? That you want to divide your own people to make sure no one can overthrow you, right? This has tremendous consequences I'm happy to talk about for overall military competence. And one thing you want to do, you also want to use corruption. Right? Corruption is a tool regimes use, right? They use it to buy off key supporters, and they use it to implicate them. Right? What you want your senior generals to know is that if you are overthrown, they will be hung from the lamppost as well. Right? So you want to use corruption to reward them, but also to make sure they're bought into your regime. All these forces that are not inherent, but are likely in many of the countries the United States is working with, make effective training in the long term far more difficult. Um, as a result, you often, have four, you often have multiple militaries in the country, some of which are hand-picked Praetorian guards. And in countries of civil wars, you're likely to see multiple militaries as well often involving uh, pro-regime militias that are often as formidable or more formidable than the regime forces themselves. One thing the United States often does in a counterterrorism context is it works with non-state forces. 
So the United States is doing this in Iraq right now. It's doing this in Syria right now. Um, it's doing this in Libya right now. It's doing this in Yemen right now. It's doing this in Somalia right now. It's doing this in Afghanistan right now. It's a long list. I'm probably missing some. Um, if you, this is something that I think is actually worth doing. But what you're doing is you're further weakening national identity. Right? You're giving arms, organization, and military experience to parts of the country that do not accept the legitimacy inherently of the national government. So often national governments would rather have an insurgency than a militia that's more effective that ostensibly swears loyalty to the government but is quite independent in reality. Um, this is the terrain that U.S. programs have to navigate. Right? And I want to go back and simply end on my last point, which is I believe strongly in these programs. Right? Because I believe if you can make marginal progress, that's tremendously beneficial, a huge cost saving overall for the United States. It's something that's better for the country in general. And something I recommend in many circumstances, and in fact, I would say for almost every intervention the United States does, a training program has to go with it. Right? And one of my criticisms of the Libya intervention was that the United States did not do a massive training program as part and parcel of this. Right? It was something that was kind of started and abandoned very quickly. And so this has to be part of our foreign policy. And as was alluded to, it has to be something that is better integrated across the US government. Right? There are so many parts of the US bureaucracy that own part of this program. And this is not something that's done in an integrated way. The funding is uneven. So I have a lot of criticisms about it, but that's because I think it's so important. So I'll end with that kind of plea for more attention to this at the most senior levels. Great. Thank you, Dan. That was a really um, compelling discussion of how complex the operating environments are. And I think you put your finger in particular on one of the biggest challenges, which is the local governance operating environment in which we're working in. And I'm wondering, uh, Tom, I'd like you to comment on what Dan has to say, but also kind of other measures that uh, DRL or other parts of the U.S. government are doing to address civil military relations in many of these countries, which are so fraught, um, and helping civilians uh, assert some kind of democratic control, whether that's through parliamentary structures and oversight, through greater transparency of budgeting, all the kind of good governance uh, tools that we have and that various uh, parts of both the U.S. government and non-governmental organizations are, are engaged in. You want all of that? <laughs> Give me a sense of how that's going. Um, great. Good. Um, so, look, there, there are a lot of examples of countries where we have programs in foreign assistance and diplomacy that aims at strengthening civilian uh, oversight of, uh, of foreign security forces. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one example where um, this is a particularly important issue uh, to us and where we have applied a fairly simple rule to um, advance the goal, and that is Burma which uh, is a very fragile, but I th think still somewhat hopeful, example of a transition from military government to democratic government that the United States has um, been promoting for over 20 years. We now have um, not full civilian control of the military there. We do have an elected civilian government that is legitimate. Um, and a still very powerful military that was running the country absolutely as uh, recently as six, five or six years ago, and which has under the constitution um, of the country left over from military rule a considerable degree of autonomy. Aung San Suu Kyi, the leader of Burma, does not have control over the Burmese military, not legally, um, not budgetary. Um, the, the military of that country very much wants to build a relationship with the United States. Why? Because we are the coolest military in the world. We have the coolest toys. We fight better than anyone else does. We provide the greatest um, respectability and, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to a, say, if you're a senior officer uh, in a country like Burma going to a uh, a three-week training course um, in the United States, or, or uh, even better, a joint exercise with the U.S. military um, is about the coolest thing that, that you can do, especially if you're trying to regain a sense of respect for your country and your military 
around the world. So what we have said to the Burmese military is that, in principle, we're open to all kinds of um, potential relationships with you in the future. But there are two conditions. Number one, you've got to quit the human rights abuses that are still going on in some of the conflicts on the periphery of that country and accept civilian control uh, of the military. And two, if you want anything from us, don't ask us. Ask your civilian leadership. If they ask us, then we will listen. And so every single contact, engagement, um, even at the relatively limited level that we have right now with the Burmese, as a matter of policy, is conducted through the civilian government because we want to, the thing that we want to train the military to do before we train them to do anything else is to respect civilian authority. Um, now, you, you'll probably uh, offer up a number of examples of countries where our policy is a bit more muddled, and, and that's true because the one thing we will never be uh, in American foreign policy is consistent. And I've always preferred inconsistency to the only form of perfect consistency that, that is possible in this world, and that's to consistently be unprincipled. Um, but I think this is an interesting model um, that perhaps uh, we, we can uh, apply more broadly, uh, particularly in situations that are as clear cut as uh, Burma in its transition from dictatorship to democracy. Can you say a little bit about the point that Dan made about how we're working in so many countries with local forces? Mm -hmm. And does that go through the same kind of Leahy vetting, or how do we screen for, for those issues? Um, so in some cases, it is legally um, subject to Leahy vetting. There are, uh, there are situations in which um, there is not a legal requirement for a variety of reasons to do Leahy vetting, but that we do it as a matter of policy anyway. Um, uh, a good example of that would be the Syrian armed opposition. Um, and again, this comes back to the point I was making that the, the more we find ourselves in a situation where the purpose of security assistance is helping people fight effectively, the, 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 the more as a matter of policy, setting aside the law, we are focused on both DOD and state, making sure that we are not um, enabling, encouraging, empowering uh, armed groups to commit human rights abuses, because we, we know from experience that that undermines um, the mission. So whether it's legally required or not, um, generally speaking, as a matter of policy, we, uh, we do uh, some degree of vetting uh, to make sure that, uh, to the extent we are able, we are not providing assistance to the worst actors. I want, to, I want to shift slightly the focus of this discussion and talk about not only the actual instruments we have as part of our security assistance to kind of influence uh, these militaries, limited influence, but still we have some tools, um, but also to think about how the U.S. Uh, can lead by example in the way it addresses um, human rights problems of our own military actions. And uh, that's been a very important theme, of course, in the last many years. And this last executive order that President Obama just issued uh, and all the 60-page you know, uh, guidebook that was released are in part designed to show that story. Um, can you say a little bit about how uh, we are addressing our own challenges and leading by example? Uh, sure. Um, as I mentioned in my, in, in my talk, this goes back before the Obama administration. It, it goes back to uh, our experience uh, in Iraq uh, beginning in 03, our experience in Afghanistan uh, in that decade, and to the lessons that our military commanders uh, learned uh, in conducting uh, particularly the, the, the counterinsurgency operations uh, in, in those countries. And, and you saw leaders like General McChrystal and General Petraeus uh, increasingly focused on um, the idea that uh, civilian protection is not just a, um, a moral and, and legal obligation. It's not something that we have to balance against uh, achieving the objectives of a military mission. It actually is the military mission that 
that in, in, a, uh, in, a, in a situation where you are fighting an insurgency or, uh, or, or a terrorist group, that the way to win is to convince the civilian population that you, the security force, are on their side. You are protecting them against um, this armed enemy. And if you can do that, then you will get better intelligence from local communities, better cooperation, uh, and you will see uh, recruitment and support uh, for the armed group you are fighting um, uh, diminish. Um, and so over time, our military in those conflicts developed rules and procedures. Some of this was very ad hoc. Um, a lot of it was not guided from Washington. Um, and what we have been trying to do in the Obama administration is to build on that work, but also to try to make sure that the lessons we've learned are um, embodied in a formal policy that will hopefully outlast us, um, that will not have to be reinvented every single time we um, uh, enter into a new military challenge uh, somewhere uh, else. And so first and foremost, the executive order uh, does that. It lays out, they're, they're not new policies, it lays out uh, practices that, that, that we have adopted uh, over the years. Um, some of them relate to um, avoiding avoidance of civilian harm. Um, so what, you know, what, what kinds of weapons do you use? What time of day do you conduct um, the strike? How do you ensure that the intelligence that you're using is solid enough in order to um, uh, conduct uh, the strike with as little risk to civilians um, as possible? Some of them relate to what we do um, in those instances where we find that we have, or there are allegations that we have caused, despite all of those precautions, we have caused civilian uh, casualties. And the basic principle there is taking uh, responsibility. Uh, if somebody makes an allegation, we don't reflexively deny it, we investigate it. Uh, if we find that we have, in fact, uh, harmed civilians, um, even if uh, there was no violation of the laws of war, no human rights abuse, technically, um, we still uh, acknowledge that we've done so. Uh, we try to make amends in a culturally uh, appropriate way, uh, and so on. The executive order also um, uh, says that we are to uh, incorporate these lessons and experiences and practices in our engagements with uh, foreign security partners. Um, and we do that, but probably not yet as much as we should, and that's something that, um, that we will be working, uh, our office in DRL will be working uh, with DOD to try to ensure that we do uh, more consistently. Dan, do you want to jump in on anything? Uh, I will go on a, I'll say a tangent, but a point that I think uh, the Secretary cannot legitimately address, but is a concern of mine, which is there are certain procedures that we use that are codified in law. There are certain ones that are interpretations of law but are debated. And then there are certain things that we do as a matter of policy. Uh, with the new administration that has expressed rhetoric, uh, both somewhat contemptuous of human rights and also the idea of, I'll say, getting tough on terrorism in the vaguest sense of that, uh, that has a potential for a lot of what we're doing right now to change dramatically. Uh, the guidance that Ted mentioned that the Obama administration put out on the rules on the use of force um, legitimately, I think, should be seen as a political document. It, if it had been done two years earlier, it would have actually constrained the Obama administration. To put it out at the end of your own administration and say this is what should constrain people, it can only be seen as self-serving. And this is very frustrating for those of us who have wanted such a document out earlier. And so a lot of what we've done as a matter of practice for years now, to me, is very much up in the air. And I hope people will think both in terms of best practices, but also in terms of best practices that accord with American values. But I worry that a lot of what's been done in a positive way may be rolled back or disregarded uh, as a new administration comes in. You know, this, it ties together this whole question of what's effective in the end of the day. And uh, Tom mentioned at the opening some work that we're doing here in the context of the community of democracies to really look at 
democratic strategies to address violent extremism, thinking about other means other than use of force that can be very effective in dealing with some very serious security threats. So there are a lot of good practices and lessons being learned as we speak out there that we hope to kind of collect and put together and put before democratic governments. Um, and the U.S. is in the presidency, so um, I think it'll be an important opportunity next summer when we come together uh, to look at that. Why don't we uh, open the floor to questions? If you could just identify yourself and... Um, the floor is open. We have someone with a mic. I see a hand in the middle there. Hi, I'm Diana Olba. I'm an independent consultant. And uh, thank you for a really fascinating presentation. I really appreciated what you both all had to say. Um, but most of the discussion has been about training of forces. And um, I understand that they Leahy law has been interpreted to apply only to training and not to equipment. Um, so I'd be really interested in what's in place or what could be put in place to prevent the sales and transfer of military equipment to units of militaries that have been engaged in, security, in uh, human rights violations. Thank you. Are there other questions? Right there. Uh, Naomi Rodarias, a Due Process of Law Foundation. So there's been a lot of talk about how the Leahy Law applies in situations of counterterrorism, in situations of military operations. I wanted to ask you to expand a little bit on uh, situations that are not counterterrorism, but that are more uh, governments that are combating uh, organized crime, uh, gang violence. I'm thinking of Mexico and the Northern Triangle of Central America. Um, how does that change how you're thinking about these issues? Thanks. Well, those are both meaty questions. Um, Tom, do you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. Uh, on, on the first question, uh, we, we interpret the Leahy Law to apply to uh, equipment as well as to training. Uh, we have procedures in place to, uh, to try to make sure, uh, in particular countries, um, that, uh, that we are doing that. It is more complicated in some cases, and I think uh, Daniel alluded to this, that um, w when, when you're training a unit, we know what unit we're training. We're doing it. Uh, often that entails you know, bringing five officers from a particular country to a training course in the United States. Again, we know who they are. We can easily decide uh, you, you are or are not eligible based on, uh, on the Leahy Law. Imagine if uh, we are uh, selling a uh, large shipment of ammunition to a foreign country's security force. Uh, very, very hard, you know, if we're talking of bullets, very, very hard to control exactly which units in that foreign security force are going to obtain those bullets or to do the kind of uh, post-sale checkups that, that will um, uh, determine um, that, uh, that, the, that the, the principles of the Leahy Law have been, uh, have been respected in, in a perfect way, if you see what I mean. Easier with an F-16, <laughs> something very big, discreet. There are less of them, um, and we, we ought to be able to know that the, you know, the, the second air wing of um, Fredonia's Air Force is receiving the F-16. Uh, but with certain forms of equipment, it is more challenging, and, and, and that's a challenge that uh, our Security and Human Rights Office, working with uh, the Pentagon, um, has, been, has been working to try to meet. Um, and then in terms of um, governments, uh, security forces fighting organized crime, actually the principle is exactly the same. Leahy law applies in exactly the same way to uh, what the Mexican military is doing domestically as it would apply to the Afghan military uh, in, uh, in fighting uh, the Taliban. If there is credible evidence that a unit has committed human rights abuses, then they cannot receive uh, assistance. Um, we've had some uh, interesting cases in other Latin American countries. Uh, in fact, uh, one interesting case in Jamaica where we did uh, remediation uh, on a unit. Am I right about that, Cobb? Did we do it in, no, it was in St. Lucia. 
Two remediations, okay. I'm all these different. Uh, in Guyana, okay, that's right. Um, uh, and so there have been a number of Leahy cases, and I, I think in some of the ones I've mentioned, there have been Leahy cases that, um, that involve abuses strictly in the context of fighting organized crime. And in a couple of them, we have been able to um, achieve the, the, the Leahy nirvana of remediation, because then you know you've made a difference. Other questions? Yes, right there in the middle. Thanks. Uh, Warren Strobel with Reuters. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the Philippines, where there's been uh, widespread extrajudicial killings. Um, if I'm correct, the U.S. government, or at least the Congress, banned some sale of uh, assault weapons to the Philippine National Police. But is there anything else under review? And uh, how do you balance human rights there against the uh, Philippines' role in countering uh, China's activities in the South China Sea? Thanks. I saw another hand. Yes, in the, right there. <clears throat> Francisco Alvarez, with, Francisco Alvarez with the Roosevelt Institute. I want to touch on the issue of uh, human rights according to whom. And by that, um, I, Daniel did touch upon this, but I'm talking about the idea of a, a, a state that doesn't necessarily reflect the interest of uh, the broader population or certain segments of the population. You know, I, I think of some countries that uh, abuse certain religious minorities with impunity, or even in, my, in the case of Mexico, uh, where, uh, let's say, indigenous communities have long been abused with impunity, and I just wonder how the State Department and the internal foreign policy apparatus goes about thinking about how they restack their priorities to reflect uh, those realities on the ground. Thank you. And one up here, please. One more. Hi, Laura Lumpy, Open Society Foundations. Um, Tom, I wonder if you could talk about the Global Magnitsky Act that was included in the National Defense Authorization Act and how that fits into the this tool, this uh, set of tools that the that, uh, State Department and the U.S. government have to respond to human rights violations by security forces. And if we could take one more. I saw a hand in the way back there. Yeah. Okay. Nicole Odersheim with the Human Rights Team in USAID. Um, I wanted to hear from uh, the whole panel. Um, I'm a little bit more familiar with what the limitations are inside USAID and the government, U.S. government right now, on um, something that I've encountered during work in the field where, particularly in this case in Cote d'Ivoire, the military wants support for military courts, military justice, military investigations, uh, and they come to USAID, and even our defense attache was coming to USAID saying, can we help with some justice uh, training, justice mechanisms inside the uh, newly reorganized Ivoirian military after the Civil War there? That was something that USAID obviously couldn't do. Um, but I'm wondering, on the other side of all of this, uh, what others are looking at for the human rights training and some of the stuff that Tom alluded to in his remarks, um, how important it is uh, when folks want to leave um, a bad situation and they're seek they're not going to go to the law local law enforcement officials, but they're going to go to other programs and other entities. Um, so the kind of softer side of this. You know, that last question, the first part of the last question, um, recalls for me a conversation I had with a democracy promotion organization in town just last week, and they were talking about wanting to do some training of security forces in Mexico, but felt that they couldn't because it was with units that had not been vetted. Now, I assume there would be an answer to that, which is the remediation answers. Like, the law allows us to work with units toward remediation. So I, maybe that was an anomaly, um, but to what extent is the prohibition on units filtered across anyone receiving U.S. government assistance? Is that uh, part of the approach as well? So anyway, a bunch of questions. Philippines, how do you find human rights in specific contexts, global Magnitsky, et cetera? Well, I can do all those. <laughs> Give me 10 more. Thanks. Um, Philippines. Um, it, 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 the uh, Leahy law absolutely applies. It applies everywhere. Um, we have used it. It has had an effect. It, it, you know, there are certainly um, parts of the, um, the the Philippine police um, uh, that um, ha uh, have 
I would say, credible allegations um, of involvement in human rights abuses against them, even preceding the uh, Duterte administration. And where that happens, uh, we apply uh, the Leahy Law. The Leahy Law does not apply to commercial sales um, of uh, ammunition, something that you also uh, mentioned. But we, we can uh, and often do in uh, a variety of countries around the world as a matter of policy decide that uh, we will not provide bullets to people who are using bullets to kill civilians. Um, you asked if it has affected our cooperation with the Philippines on uh, issues like the South China Sea, and I would say no uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, we have a very strong mutual interest uh, with the Philippines in uh, protecting uh, freedom of navigation and uh, international law. Um, that common interest, I don't think, has changed, uh, despite the various changes that, have, uh, uh, that uh, the Philippines has seen politically uh, in uh, the last year. Um, uh, and um, the, uh, our cooperation with uh, the Philippine Armed Forces uh, has not been affected uh, by these allegations, because um, the allegations do not, at this point, involve uh, any members of, or units of the Philippine uh, Armed Forces. And uh, it is important that uh, uh, that, that remain the case. A um, uh, question on uh, indigenous communities uh, in Mexico. That, that um, uh, you touched on a number of, of general issues there. Um, but again, I would say that it, it really doesn't matter what the context is. Um, when it comes to our legal obligations. Um, obviously, policy is affected by, by context, and, and context can be complicated. But as far as our legal uh, obligations go, um, it, it, it doesn't matter who the perpetrator is or who the victim is. If there is credible evidence of gross human rights abuses, there are certain things that we cannot do, and there are certain things that we have to do. So it's an evidence-driven process, which doesn't mean that, um, uh, that, that we, we always do what a particular victim, victim community might expect us to do, because the evidence you know, isn't always up to the, the level of detail or standard that, uh, that we might need. Um, but uh, something else that my bureau does is we work with a lot of local human rights groups around the world, uh, and we provide a very different sort of training. Um, to, to them, and that is, how do you document human rights abuses? How do you bring these facts to our attention in a way that would trigger the application of, um, of one of these laws? Global Magnitsky Act. Um, we have, um, for a number of years, on occasion, um, as a country, applied targeted financial sanctions. Um, as a tool uh, of, for holding accountable um, people who do bad things, um, whether they are engaged in um, uh, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction or financing of terrorism uh, or human rights abuses in many cases. The success that we've had in Burma that I mentioned, I think, came about in part because of the use of, uh, of this tool against uh, officials in that government who are guilty of human rights abuses. We've used it in many, many uh, other uh, places. Today, I believe we will be announcing um, some sanctions on uh, officials in, the, uh, uh, in a major African country. I won't get ahead of the announcement because I think it's out, but I won't get ahead of it if I'm wrong, um, who are, uh, um, um, uh, we believe, involved in uh, th uh, threats to human rights and democracy in that country. But for right now, under the law, um, for the United States to sanction an individual um, for human rights abuses in a particular country, we have to, the President of the United States has to, issue an executive order that declares, quote, a state of national emergency 
between the United States and that country as a whole, which to most countries, when they actually read the language of this executive order, which is mandated by law, reads almost like a declaration of war against that country. Um, so if the president wants to sanction one person in Burma for um, mass killing or rape or anything else, nonproliferation, what have you, he has to declare a state that a state of national emergency exists between the United States and Burma, which is a very weird thing to say at a time when we have an increasingly close relationship with that country. Um, recently, um, actually last year, we imposed sanctions very well deserved on some officials of the Maduro government in Venezuela for um, uh, human rights reasons, corruption reasons, um, and all the bad and nasty things that are happening in Venezuela. In order to do it, the president had to issue this executive order, and Maduro waved this language in the air and said, look, the, you know, the Americans are declaring war on us. They're, they're calling us a threat to global peace and security and all this stuff. All we want to do is to hold accountable some individuals, but we had to do that under the law. So what the global Magnitsky language does is it gives the president of the United States global human rights sanctions authority. It doesn't force him to do anything. But in the future, if the president wants to sanction an individual for gross human rights abuses, he will not have to, in effect, declare war on the country to do it. So that's what uh, that is all about. Um, question about, uh, uh, or at least, I don't know if it was about Cote d'Ivoire, but you used it as, as an example. Um, I, I think w w one of the I'll make a broad point here, which is one of the biggest human rights challenges that we face, one of the biggest rule of law challenges that we face around the world is access to justice. We talk about, account, you know, you heard me talking about accountability and, um, and you know, the key to the Leahy laws, you've got to hold people accountable if they uh, abuse human rights. But if you don't have honest, well-functioning institutions of accountability uh, in a country, that can be very um, difficult. Uh, to do, um, and um, uh, and it also th there's the other problem that if if you are a security force leader in that country and you're fighting terrorism, and you don't have honest, efficient, independent courts in your country um, that will uh, be willing and able to prosecute the terrorists who you capture lawfully you are going to be tempted to kill them um, extrajudicially because you're not going to trust your justice system uh, to do its job if you capture them uh, lawfully. So um, one of the biggest, and I would say still unmet, challenges that we face um, in a lot of the countries that we've been talking about is, is to help the development of and protection of these independent institutions of justice. We do have um, in Africa something that we call the Security and Governance Initiative, um, which does not cover every country in the con continent, but does um, cover uh, a few, including Kenya, including Tunisia, a couple of others I'm forgetting right now, um, uh, where uh, leadership has demonstrated a commitment to these principles, at least in principle. Um, and which aims to channel security assistance more towards these institution building uh, areas. And in Kenya in particular, we have offered um, the government greater assistance um, to develop courts and prosecutors that can function, again, honestly and effectively um, in uh, dealing with these terrorism and national security uh, issues so that there's no excuse whatsoever for the security forces to go around the system. Um, da, 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 da. And then you had one last question, which was, I did say I could take <laughs> I 10 did. more, and now I'm... Well, we're actually to... almost out of time, okay. So, but that was a very uh, good set of, of answers. And maybe I'll ask Dan to see if you have any final remarks. Uh, no, nothing dramatic to add. I would just simply say that um, so much of what we've done in the last eight or even the last 16 years 
uh, is really in play, I think, in a very dramatic way and will be in the next four years, perhaps, uh, perhaps longer. And so a lot of what we've gotten used to, for better or for worse, uh, to me, uh, we, have to re we have to really start to look at uh, what can be preserved and how much is going to change. So my final word to, is that one of the threads of this conversation is, is the realism behind it. You know, what's effective in addressing uh, security threats that we face around the world and how human rights and civilian control of the military and these fundamental principles are not just American values, but are actually key instruments for getting to better security outcomes. And I think that's a key lesson that we've learned over the years and we don't want to have to relearn in the coming years. And so I think that's a point that we hope to come back to over the coming years. And that's this democracy and security dialogue that we're working on with the State Department hopes to address as well. So I really appreciate uh, the way this has uh, played out and want to thank both Dan and Tom for a very enriched conversation. Thank you.